since onwards as a reaction to the previous culture policy paradigm of cultural democratization. And some of you who were here with us on Tuesday morning, Louis Bonnet also gave this sort of overview of the timelines of different culture policy paradigms. The culture democratization, so the paradigm that was there before the culture democracy was a top-down approach that essentially privileged certain forms of culture programming that were deemed to be a public good. And not only was culture democratization concerned with aesthetically superior forms of artistic creation, there were also, it also affirmed the role of an expert who determined what was given to who and how in a sense of culture content. But culture democracy also assumed that all culture needs and desires of all members of society were alike. So culture democracy strived to dismantle this essential elitist approach that inherited most of the postulates of culture policy from the 19th century with a more pluralist and inclusive approach. Overcoming the notion of static and hegemonic understanding of culture, the emergence of culture democracy concept brought significant changes in the culture policy formation, such as the emphasis on cultural access and participation, questions of multiculturalism and culture diversity, as well as inclusion, culture rights, and the recognition of local and community culture values, which quite importantly implied the policies were recognizing and activating local levels, but also the role of the civil society. In essence, culture democracy was a shift from top-down to bottom-up policy that underlined the government's responsibility to provide equal opportunities for citizens to be culturally active, but on their own terms. As such, culture pro the democracy provided a stronger legitimation, and still does, for the principle of state subsidy with the concept of culture as a process in which we are all participatory. So substituting monoculture concept of culture for pluralistic one, culture democracy was practically applied through a capillary system of culture, fiscal and political decentralization, but also through the development of the analytical arguments of audience development. Most notable example that I'm gonna mention here today of the research from that time on the cultural participation originates in the 1960s Pierre Bourdieu's work on the museum attendance which he published with Alain Darbel in the study called The Love of Art. So the statistical <coughs> analysis and other observational examinations of the museum visitors' social patterns of experience gave way an interpus for the development of culture policy focused on the policy problem of cultural inequality, or in other words, on the differential and engagement of the populace of particular country or territory with its public resources. Now, link between citizens and communities with the public resources is one of the main qualities of culture democracy and advancements in the culture policy evolution. To this end, we must take a moment to reflect on the historical time of origin and the development of culture democracy with the emphasis on a social political context. In that line, culture democracy is closely linked with the processes of modernization, with the establishment and the development of the welfare state, with the development of culture policy as a field itself, and with the development of a more refined variations of public support for culture, but also with the overall development on the human and cultural rights discourse that we heard about in Mercedes Giovinazzo's presentation yesterday. So culture, culture democracy matured along with the modernization forces of social evolution that created perspectives for self-expression, for new institutional formations, for occupational diversification, for organizational differentiation and mass political involvement. And this is just among some uh, other categories. As the modernization processes are conducive to the processes of democratization, we could say that culture democracy was a consequence or power pro process to the flourishment of democracy in a post-World War II era, but it also surpassed the political borders of democratic systems and regimes. Coming from a post, uh, previously, sorry, communist or socialist state of Yugoslavia, depending on who's labeling it, whether it's a communist or socialist, 
culture democracy was ever strong culture paradigm in that previous state of ours, where culture democracy in a period of post-1960s introduced culture as a new social substance that had to be lessened of the hierarchical relations and bureaucratization. Rather, the aspirations, needs, and interests of the community were placed center stage for culture policy that had to overcome the alienation of the people. So it could be said that the state of culture democracy in a sense of citizen empowerment through culture and providing systemic space, like in a metaphor, of, for the bottom-up voices, needs, and solutions was in many aspects more elaborate and functional in a pre-democratic Croatia through the system of self-management than it is in our current democratic state. This also adds to the argument that culture democracy is or was a culture policy paradigm or trend at the time that spread across to Europe, not necessarily conditioned by the democracy itself, its regressions or progressions. The original concept of culture democracy fosters power to the people or positive notions of populism and it nourishes the democratic of, uh, qualities of any political system in a sense that it seeks to engage and open perspectives for all the wide specter of multiculturality to find its space and operate from within that systemic space of the cultural system. The values of culture derived from interpreting culture democracy as a counter resistance towards cultural elitism have now been embedded in the key objectives of the most present day culture policies in European countries. Pillars of culture democracy, such as affirmation and promotion of culture diversity, multiculturalism, intercultural dialogue and cooperation, cultural rights and ethics, cultural participation, audience development, access to culture, multi-stakeholder and participatory governance have now been the key themes of action for a number of supranational and supragovernmental bodies such as UNESCO, Council of Europe, European Parliament, etc. But accordingly, the changes in the culture policy that have been proposed by the postulates of culture democracy nominally assume priority in the discourse of culture development. But in the reality, the development imperatives in cultures shift towards the actual tendencies in policy changes in the direction of instrumentalization and commodification. So we need to talk about the neoliberal approach to understanding and practicing culture democracy, which implies or seeks that the vertical nature of culture policy and cultural programs are flattened with the aim of making the culture and artistic creation so much more appealing and attractive to the wider masses. In so far, the issues arise on how to apply the principles rules and mechanisms of culture democracy, such as access, inclusion, and participation, without endangering or compromising the meaning of culture, content, and artistic experimentation. In other words, opening culture policy towards this, um, but towards participation as an acting principle does not imply anything goes or everything is art discourse, because in that way, it could be said that the field of culture and culture policies could lose their essence, sense, and basic rationality. Moreover, diluting the critical and inspirational edge of culture and artistic creation has been blurring the lines between participation, instrumentalization, and populism. In other words, while the culture and artistic production is increasingly becoming regulated with the dominant free market logic, the abolishment of the elitist and hierarchical approaches in the processes of cultural and artistic production, dissemination, and consumption is not matched with the changes in the culture policy structures that still function in rather restricted hierarchical and centralized manner. This is where the culture, the, the paradox of culture policy development happens. In order to increase the level of accessibility or the consumption, Accessibility becomes dependent on financial capacity while the levels of accountability are decreasing. This brings us to another important issue to take into consideration when discussing culture democracy, and this is the publicness of culture or the public quality and ownership of culture. The very notion of culture democracy stands upon the assumption that culture is a public good. 
So how can culture democracy be supported and developed in the times of dominant creative economy paradigm and privatization and corporatization of the culture field? In a sense, the culture development and changes in culture policy are like parallel constructs built on the opposite perspectives and value systems of culture democracy and creative economy paradigms. Consequently, cards and cultural practices have been strenuously positioned between the need that they demonstrate and generate a benefit over and above the aesthetic in order to provide evidence and justification in obtaining shrinking public support and funding and imperative to show their marketable value in order to secure income and investment. In that sense, questions arise to what degree democratic elements are maintained in culture development and how much participation and culture democracy legitimize culture development, which is due to the imperative of creative economy, finding its means for expansion in entertainment, pure consumerism, and instrumentalism. However, zooming into the present times of democratic recessions and populism, of populism that is no longer pluralist, but that is authoritarian, a caution arises to the negative potentials of culture democracy. And I have to take a sip of water for this, sorry. <laughs> so as I said, although culture democracy may be positively related to democracy, that doesn't have to be necessarily the case, as culture democracy may also serve authoritarian purposes. What do these involve? Well, this involves favoring of the nativism, promoting monoculturalism over multiculturalism, promoting national self-interest over international cooperation and development and aid, promoting closed borders over, international, over, over free flow of people, ideas, and labor, and promoting, obviously, traditionalism over progressive and liberal societal values. The imminent dangers of such articulation of culture democracy are now, unfortunately, visible in many parts of Europe and have to be addressed urgently by policies that will not only use culture as an agent of change towards infusing tolerance, empathy, mutual understanding and acceptance, but that will also be transversal and vernacular action across policies such as education, such as economy, foreign affairs, and even defense. So finally, I have no recipe for the future. So I have no certainty to state now before you and to even state to myself on how culture democracy is to work or function in the future. How is it, how is it gonna unravel? Apart from a very sort of general observations, and these include that the new horizons are no longer found on the above levels, but on the ones below. So we are not looking for the solution in the discourses of governments, but in the actions of civil movements, in the actions of civil society, and a whole myriad of actors that work relentlessly to restore not only the functioning of democracy, but also to bring back the trust as a main quality and postulate of modern societies, as well as the sustainability of public space in its physical, in its systemic, in its mediational, communicational, and other metaphors. The resource of public space, and this was also touched upon by Mercedes Giovinazzo yesterday, is becoming increasingly endangered. And that resource, coupled with the method of trust and engagement, maintain a non-commodified public sphere and cultural public values as vital fundaments for pluralism and culture democracy that will not be driven by any particular or dominant interest, either market, either xenophobic, nationalist, or populist agenda, but that, are, that is committed and focused on the needs, aspirations, and well-being of the people that make contemporary society. So in these conditions that are yet to be achieved by all of us, I believe that culture democracy stands a chance and can flourish in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for such a coherent lecture and the introduction to this uh, topic. I would like to invite you all to take the notes because uh, we are going to open a uh, discussion for your intervention uh, just after the Stephen intervention. So please, Stephen, take the floor and show us your performance and choreography. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm using a different microphone. Can you hear me? Yeah? Cool. Um, so I'm going to try and follow on from what Anna said and give you some kind of talking points from that kind of overview, if you like, to take forward into your discussions and so on. Um, yeah, so this is what we were asked to talk about, as Anna said, history, uh, the implications for cultural policy uh, and the future cultural landscape. Um, I'm going to start in the present and then I'm going to go backwards and then I'm going to come all the way forwards to the future. Um, so the first thing I want to say, um, and I, this is the only piece of translation you're getting before anybody gets too excited uh, about anything for the Portuguese speakers, uh, and apologies if it's wrong, that was my own attempt. Um, it is the vanity of every age to consider itself in crisis. Um, if you look at the history of cultural policy in your own country, as I have done the history of cultural policy uh, in England, it is just one crisis after another, quite frankly. Um, whether that crisis is about have not having enough money or spending the money that you have in the wrong places or the wrong art forms or in the wrong ways or in cities and not in the country and so on. Cultural policy is just riven with these things. Um, but at the same time, I do think we are at a very particular moment in history where I think this crisis uh, is actually of a quite different order, uh, the ones we've seen before. Um, so I want to start with this idea uh, that cultural democracy is symptomatic of a crisis of cultural authority. We see this everywhere, not just in the cultural sphere. We see it in the discussions around expertise, uh, the kind of anti-expert agenda. We see it in fake news. We see it in criticism of any kind of professional uh, approach that embodies any kind of ideas of authority and expertise. And part of the reason for that is that those ideas of authority and expertise also come with power. And that is the problem when people are attempting to redistribute power or take it away from certain groups or to claim it for themselves, they start to critique authority. And we've seen uh, in the UK, at least, um, I've just put up these two um, reports from John Holden, um, not because they're the best ones, but just because they look good on a PowerPoint slide. Um, um, but they make quite good points. This um, cultural policy is a closed conversation among experts. Now, this. This is over 10 years old, I think. So you can see that this whole conversation has been happening for quite a long time. Um, and this calls for a democratic mandate from the public and starts to talk about participatory democracy and participatory budgets. Um, and here, the value of culture cannot be expressed only with statistics. This was when the critique of that kind of audience development, managerial approach, you know, everybody in the UK sector fell in love with the idea that they were kind of management people and like me went and did an MBA um, and we all got KPIs and smart objectives and fell in love with this whole idea that metrics were going to save us in some way but of course the problem is that the value of culture uh, cannot be expressed through statistics. Um, and I think what's interesting is that this crisis of authority I think is quite particularly acute at an institutional level, partly because institutions, and we're in a glorious institution right now, have this material, physical embodiment of that power, of cultural authority. Um, I would argue that many cultural institutions, if not all cultural institutions, are specifically built to show power to people who have been denied it. The people who don't participate in culture are put off by intimidating buildings that manifest that power, and that's quite deliberate. Um, there's a whole other way of looking at that, but that's just mine. Um, but I think this manifestation of power creates one of the real problems, which is, are cultural institutions part of the problem when we need to talk about cultural democracy? And of course, what we've done since the end of the Second World War is spent huge amounts of money investing in a physical infrastructure. In the 1970s, we built a lot of arts centres. We built a lot of concert halls. We built, you know, 
all of these different types and orders of institutional representation of particular expressions of power and authority. So I think for people who work in the cultural sector in institutions in ways we need to think about how that power and authority is being manifested. One of the other things that we need to think about um, is if we're going to challenge or at least question these ideas of cultural authority, then we can't just decide that we're going to replace it with a new position, which is, well, we've decided that now cultural, authority, cultural democracy is important. So we need to be quite reflexive as we're going forward in terms of having the debate, um, sort of acknowledging and examining the assumptions that we're making taking forward in articulating a new cultural policy position. So who gets to decide what cultural democracy means? So, thankfully, I am here. That is a joke, obviously. Um, I, wouldn't be make, I wouldn't be making those uh, decisions for you unless I was being paid a lot more money, quite frankly. Um, but, so, there, there's one point. Anyway, we'll come back to this. Um, so I'm going to go, go backwards a little bit. Um, for me, a lot of the... Um, can you see those? A lot of the... A lot of the discourse, a lot of the conversation at policy levels, at practice levels, about cultural democracy in the present day really fails to acknowledge a very radical political history on which it was based. And Anders talked about this. It's developed over a number of decades. Okay? So you've got Owen Kelly's Manifesto for Cultural Democracy. I think that was 1986. Art with People. Um, these works, like the pedagogy of the oppressed and so on, are, are tangential but important works that articulate this. It's very important, I think, um, and I'm not going to dwell on it because we don't have time, but we can talk about it, that cultural democracy was seen as part of a much wider social and political project when it was conceived, uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s, because it was felt to be part and parcel of economic democracy and social democracy. It wasn't just something that was a conversation to take place uh, within the cultural sector. And part of this radical political history uh, presents a serious challenge to people who are working in the cultural sector today. It, cultural democracy, in terms of those writings and, and many of the others, present a really profound challenge, very explicitly, to Europe's cultural heritage. Okay? Now, I have just randomly picked some of these dead white guys here. I could have picked lots of other dead white men as well. Um, there's lots to choose from. Um, but it's a really key point because the institution that we're in now and the institutions which many of you work in and the narratives and the histories and the policies which form the philosophy or, if you like, the ideology on which those institutions sit is fundamentally questioned by cultural democracy, okay? Just the depth of the challenge is, is a really significant issue. Um, and I want to give a particular example of this. I'm going to reference a quote from this book, Artists and People, by Sue Braden. Uh, it was written in 1978. It's been out of print uh, for at least two decades, I think. Um, I think I paid like £40 for my copy or something like that, um, because that's how much of a cultural policy nerd I am. Um, anyway, so, uh, to quote Sue Braden, and this is, she's talking about these guys here, uh, some of the other ones. Uh, That's quite a bold statement to challenge the entire Enlightenment cultural history upon which all of our uh, current cultural sector is based, but there we go. So let's have a think about that. Um, I'm not knocking the Arts Council of Great Britain or its current incarnation either. Um, 
it's just, I use this quote, I don't necessarily agree with what she says, but I use it as a way of just giving a sense of the extent to which cultural democracy in that age, and I think it's a key question of what cultural democracy means in the present age, but in that age, in the age in which it really was written and documented and discussed, it considered these issues to be, uh, you know, it was, it was dealing at this scale, if you like. Now, what's important about this as well is that the Gulbenkian Foundation funded that book. Um, and the foundation said they recognised the controversial nature of community arts in advanced industrial societies and believe that community arts will be better helped if controversy is open rather than hidden, with differences freely discussed and issues identified. Now, again, this is just a talking point. I just kind of want to throw these things out, um, and you could take them away and discuss them with colleagues and so on. But there is a question here about whether we're truly having a conversation about cultural democracy and what it means, or whether the institutions and the vested power and authority in our organisations simply want to take this seemingly nice idea and roll it into the way uh, that they already exist, to kind of neuter it, if you like. Um, so I'm just going to close just by some comments on cultural democracy future. So, Rebecca Blackman, where are you? <laughs> Um, here's the Arts Council's draft 10-year uh, strategy. Now, this is not a quote about cultural democracy, but I just want to give you an example of, I think, where we are in policy terms. The document says, by 2030, we anticipate where we will investigate in organisations and people that differ in many cases from those that we support today. Okay? Now, you could read that as saying, we are going to adopt quite a radical different approach to how we understand cultural policy, and that will result in us changing quite considerably the portfolio of clients that we have. Or you could read it as saying, organisations come and go, people die, someone's going to get run over by a bus at some point, um, there's bound to be change. Huh, change, OK? Um, so, you know, these things... Um, I mean, uh, cultural democracy doesn't appear in the, in the, as a term in the strategy, but once you begin a debate about dismantling and disrupting the power structures and the policy structures that exist, you can start to see these things appearing um, in different places. Now, just to go back to institutions very briefly, one of the... Uh, this is the Royal Opera House in London, Covent Garden... Um, one of the challenges with effecting any kind of change in the cultural sector, and where specifically when we talk about power, is the hidden power within these organisations, the vested interest and the political leverage and connections that organisations and great cultural institutions have. Um, there is an apocryphal story that whenever the Arts Council is considering cutting the budget for the Royal Opera House, the phone starts ringing in number 11 Downing Street because a member of the board has phoned up to complain about it. Um, so we're not just talking innocently about policy change. You know, We can't just sit here and say, we should have a more democratic approach, we should reconsider cultural value. Let's change it and let's have a culturally democratic approach because there are whole material considerations about power and authority that we can't even see that are vested in that infrastructure, which will resist change. Um, and I think there is an argument that says, and I'm not interested in knocking the Royal Opera House. One of my best friends is the director of opera at the Royal Opera House. But um, one of the things is that the interests of cultural institutions like the Royal Opera House are not the same interests of the furthering the cultural sector. They are different things. What is good for the Royal Opera House, in my opinion, is not good for the cultural sector in many ways. So again, when we talk about this idea of democracy in relation to cultural policy, we've got some big issues to address. Um, so I'm just going to give you a list uh, of some of these. As we talked about there, if, if cultural democracy were adopted as a much broader, more impactful policy approach, would we see a rebalancing of funding portfolios? In a zero-sum scenario, that would mean taking money away from some of the established institutions to redirect it. There's no magic money tree 
creating money to come into this to broaden the scope of things. We have a new Centre for Cultural Value um, in Leeds in the UK, specifically designed to address these questions of how do we value culture. And this is what cultural democracy, for me, um, is really about. Who gets to decide what has value? Who gets to put those different values in a hierarchy? Who gets to decide what's valuable for me and valuable for you? This debate, I mean, has been happening for a long time. Really important to note that if you look at the history of cultural democracy, it's a culture of failure. I like to kind of say cultural democracy is a lot like communism or socialism. It's a really lovely idea that never happened. Um, because it is a history of failure in terms of its failure to gain traction, um, the way that the community arts movement, I think, was quite co-opted uh, by the, the wider arts sector. Um, and then to overtly institutional expressions of power. That's slightly wordy, but I think what I'm kind of saying there is we've already started to see a move towards national theatre companies that don't have buildings, um, companies that do site-specific performance and don't have venues and so on. You can read that as a way of going, actually, we're moving away from this institutional idea of power. Um, but as I said earlier, we've invested so much in that institutional infrastructure, that's a real problem. Um, and I put this in... Um, intersectional uh, theory is, is very popular uh, and has been for some time within kind of uh, academic circles. Um, and I've just put this in partly to say that, to go back to that history of cultural democracy, um, in, a, in a very overly reductive way, if you look at things in an intersectional way, you are taking all of the different political, social and economic factors that are impacting on a certain situation. Um, and I suspect that in two or three years' time, we will be back somewhere talking about intersectional cultural policy and the need to recognise all of the different variances uh, that are impacting on how we think about funding for the arts. Um, but that's just a list. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail because I just want to talk very briefly uh, about you lot and this idea of an emotional attachment to our labour. Um, and this is something that resonates with me uh, quite a lot as well. So the cultural sector as a vocation offers prestige and self-fulfilment in place of material reward and requires a strong personal commitment which can be subjectively experienced as selflessness and passion. Just in case you're confused by the language, material reward means money, uh, obviously, <laughs> and not having any. Um, now, I think, again, this is part of the process of being reflective and reflexive about challenging ourselves and each other and institutions and policy frameworks um, about whether we are uh, indeed the baddies in this situation. Um, this is a, if you don't know this, this is a comedy, famous comedy sketch where they're wearing Nazi uniforms in the war and they suddenly think, are we the baddies um, in this? Because there is a sense in which if you work, in the, if you work to promote the democratisation of culture and high art and, and elitism and so on, uh, people who uh, propose cultural democracy might indeed see you as the baddies. So I'm going to close with a quote uh, from Mark F Woo from Mark Fisher. Um, and what I want to suggest to you is we can take this term emancipatory politics here and substitute the term cultural democracy. This isn't about cultural policy, by the way, but I just think it really resonates with me, so I just use it in every presentation, even if I just have to crowbar it in right at the end. Um, but that's the challenge, I think. This is the challenge of cultural democracy. Um, to take what is presented and inevitable as being a mere contingency. Um, so that's everything for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Anna, one more time. So taking into consideration that we are talking about the cultural democracy, the concept which foster power to people, I decided to open the floor for discussion. So I invite you to intervene 
and to put your comments and the questions to our two amazing keynotes with different style of expression. So please raise your hands and uh, the mic will be there. So we have one hand here. So anyone, another one? So where is the, okay, the mic is coming. Yes. Is this one? Oh, no, you need that. No, no. It's uh, over there. Hello, my name is uh, Nana Ruvira, and I uh, am from Denmark, working with audience development. Uh, thank you so much for both these uh, very enlightening and very pessimistic uh, speeches, uh, which is always so funny. But um, what I'm what I'm uh, thinking about now is so. If this is this is the history of us and how we uh, work, uh, do you have any suggestions to why do we continue then? Because there's no money in it. It's not at all cultural democracy, and uh, we very often fail. Why do we continue? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, is this still working? Am I still on? Yes. Yeah. Um, apologies if you found that pessimistic. It was meant to be more, slightly more challenging, I thought. But um, um, well, a it depends where you're coming from on this. You know, um, there's nothing wrong because there, there are no experts or value anymore. Uh, but there's nothing wrong um, with still believing in the model of the democratization of culture, or what Anna called cultural democratization. Um, you know, I really love institutions. I'm, I'm an atheist. I still got married in a church, you know, because it's a beautiful building. Um, and I, I love those kind of social practices of weddings and things, you know. Um, so anyway, so I, let's talk about my wedding instead. Um, <laughs> um, I, 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 I suspect Anna is the same, but I, I've been on a journey with this. Um, for many years about, uh, I mean, I, and I suppose it's discovering the, the statistics and the academic work around the consumption of culture, around the fact that certainly in a UK context, culture is consumed by predominantly white, middle-class, educated people. And I don't think that's acceptable as a state of affairs. And that's why I got involved in working in audience development, and I used to run an audience development agency. Um, but I think it's just a sense of if you, if you genuinely believe in, let's call it the transformative power of culture, even though I don't like that phrase, but if you believe in that transformative power of culture, then the challenge is to find ways of giving that transformation to more people. And all that I'm saying is that institutions might not be the right way, or the cultural policy we have right now might not be the right way. Um, it doesn't seem to be changing things in any great hurry, you know. Um, I mean, I, I always sound like I'm picking on the Royal Opera House, and I'm really not, but they have been the highest funded Arts Council organisation every year since 1946. And though that kind of lack of change um, is problematic for many, many different reasons. I mean, I, you know, I was telling the story last night about when I cried listening to opera for the first time. Um, and, you know, I'm sharing with you now. It's like, uh, this don't, that doesn't leave this room. Um, but, you know, I, I, it's not a, an issue with culture. It's for me, to summarise this very long answer, um, it's about the mechanisms for delivering the potential of culture to more people. And I think our challenge is to change those mechanisms. Do you want me to Anna, would you like to add anything or well, to um, comments to react? Opera has not been the... Tell us about opera is cry. such an always easy target, isn't it? When we're talking about a cultural policy, it's always the she opera. She's a concert pianist. Yeah, I'm a side. classical <laughs> musician. I always have to stand in defence. Um, but, I mean, these formations of artistic expression I see as... Um, heritage they're not like 
They've always been very expensive. They've always been like dominant in the powers hidden or explicit that they represent. But in a sense, they also represent the narrative of the development of the humankind. And this is something that I have to uh, that we have to deal with on who makes this narrative, not mm -hmm. you, but you know who makes the narrative. And about your question, there are many deficits and deficiencies in cultural democracy. Um, but the reason why not to give up is that it directly and explicitly relates to some of the most inspirational and binding documents and ideas and principles and values and imaginaries of what like human societies can be now or in the future. Like culture democracy is possibly the only concept or the only paradigm of culture policy as I said, that really sort of directly is linked to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that is directly linked to the Declaration of Freedom of Artistic Expression and Culture Diversity, that really sort of sets the challenge of making the society better. I know this sounds like a general place in a sense, but like when we think about democracy, that it was very deficient in the times of its origin in Athens. And we still are striving so many centuries on to make it work. I can't see the reason to give up on culture and democracy because it hasn't worked properly in the past. Wait, let me count. I'm not very good with numbers. 60s to 20, so, uh, 50 years <laughs> or so. Years. 20, 60 years or so. So um, to me, like I think on a personal and professional levels, we always have to have a guiding value of belief systems. And I am not like an advocate to impose culture democracy as a guiding principle or a value for all the culture organizations that are here or culture policy makers or whatever. But on the other hand, it does have to be given a chance as a culture policy paradigm. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Uh, I saw another. And here, so where is the mic? Uh, I actually have two questions, but the first one is related maybe to the one that she uh, asked, but I didn't actually catch it really well, so maybe it's the same. Um, regarding opera, what do you think are the, why, why did you say that Opera has a different need or a different goal uh, through, I mean, mm, from the other cultural organizations. Which are these goals that you think are different? The question is because you mentioned on one point when you show us the picture that uh, uh, the things different, the, different the, the sector, you know? Um, <coughs> Can you explain a little bit or go deeper? I, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be talking about the opera for the entire opera. session. Now at it's just an easy target, okay? Yeah, um, the, uh, uh, let's look at the Royal Opera House as a particular institution, okay? Its business model is completely broken, okay? It operates at about 98% of capacity but its tickets are incredibly expensive and it receives the most subsidy of any arts organization. That is a broken model. Um, irrespective of the huge amounts of philanthropy and fundraising and donations it gets, okay? There are people in that organization who earn over a million pounds a year in their salaries in a subsidized cultural organization, okay? Um, and the only, from my, from my perspective, the only legitimation for that model existing with public subsidy is the concept of excellence. Because it's the concept of excellence that legitimates all that costs and all that business model, okay? And the concept of excellence is a product of all of these different narratives and traditions that we've been talking about. Now, we could do a whole, I mean, I could do the rest of the day on how you know, problematic excellence is as an idea. And it comes backwards and forwards in cultural policy. So under the Blair government, uh, we had a whole report championing excellence 
as the model, uh, the McMaster report, it was called, championing excellence as the model. Um, it's easy to get very political on these things. There is a solid argument for saying that excellence as an idea within art is purely a way of legitimating a certain hierarchy of cultural value. And the model that we have is a hierarchy of cultural value that has opera and ballet and classical music at the top. And then as you move further down that hierarchy, art forms get denigrated to the point that they're not considered worthy of public subsidy. Now there are whole other vectors coming into this um, around which art forms can survive in the market, which art forms can't, which art forms are thought to have some kind of cost disease in their business models that doesn't enable them to be self-sufficient and so on. And what you have now is a very very complex range and ecosystem where you have opera companies which receive no public subsidy at the same time as you have opera companies arguing that they cannot exist without public subsidy. Um, so I don't think there are any easy answers. Um, and one of the challenges with cultural democracy or any form of cultural policy is that in inevitably it's seeking some kind of overarching answer or framework and you will always find something that doesn't fit within that framework, because that's one of the problems of making any kind of policy um, at all. Um, the fundamental question for me with opera, and I've had this conversation with uh, Oliver Mears at the Royal Opera House, Oliver believes quite passionately that everybody, and it means everybody, can enjoy and love opera. Now, I find that an interesting and challenging idea. Um, <laughs> but if you, if you genuinely believe that, as I think he does, then your question is, well, in that context, how do you then bring opera to as many people as possible so that they can enjoy it and love it? And the way that you do that is not by having the Royal Opera House where you have to pay £300 for a bad ticket at the back of the stalls. Okay? That is not how you do it. So I think it's going to go back to the idea of delivery mechanisms are the question. I'm not really taking issue so much with the principle of it. As I said, I cried listening to opera for the first time recently. That was a weird moment for me. Um, so it's not the art form particularly that I have a problem with. It's the mechanism by which it is supposed to be being brought to more people and clearly is not. And that's the challenge, I think. That's the issue. Does that even answer your question? Sorry. I'm giving really long answers today. Stay clear of me later. Anna? <laughs> well, I'm going to try and answer it. I think that the main problem of operas is that since their origin, they've been the most expensive type of artistic production ever. And the thing that happened with those types of artistic sort of expressions is that they have not put themselves into the times of change in the sense that the production costs, or what he says, business model of whatever, even the repertoire still functions in the same way it functioned a couple of centuries ago. But everything around them changed. And this is why I compare it to the built heritage, which is also like you have the art formations like opera and built heritage, let's not kid ourselves, are the main sort of portions of culture budget, public culture budgets ever. And this is the issue, like if we're going to talk about rebalancing funding for culture in the future, to reconsider the main postulate of public policies, all of them, not the cultural one just, and that is that the policies are made so that people should have what they should have, not what they want. This is the basic rationale of public subsidy for anything. It is the assumption that if you want to go and see Tom Cruise movie, you will pay for it, or any blockbuster movie. But if you want to go and see a heritage that defines your identity, and then we, then we come to a completely different and new trap, is like what defines us being nationally, locally, or for example, on a European scale, this should be made accessible to you as your own good, hence the subsidy. And this, when you put all of this in a remit of discussion of power and authority, 
who decides what you should have, how you should have it, which is what I um, opened in my presentation. We are faced with a very, very difficult task of having to say what? Okay, so we're not going to talk about opera. Opera can contemporize themselves and become what? Musicals that people are going to pay for. And we're going to forget about Wagner and Verdi and all of the marvels that defined, as I said, not like European identities, but that, you know, people claim that define some of the trajectories of human development in a civilized era. Or we're going to, you know, like um, flatten the cultural heritage sites and build something new because it's going to be more in the tunes of the time that we live in. So all of these are very sort of difficult decisions that seek much wider and more intense public discourse that is missing. And I think this is one of the key problem, is that these discussions on the power, not just the devolution of power, that is the type of, that is just a matter of mechanism and normative um, uh, regulations of how we're going to disperse the power, how we're going to make joint decisions. But that I don't see, and I mean, correct me here, that these conversations are happening enough on the levels of those who, who make the decision or those that surround them. Thank you. So we have two more up. Yes, I just had another, another question, sorry. Uh, um, it's basically on the, like how, how would you, I mean, at some point, Anna, you said that there are some mechanisms uh, of cultural democracy that are different. So uh, how would you um, like apply these mechanisms without compromising the quality of artistic value? Ooh, that's a very, yeah. <laughs> Don't, Don't go from opera to that. Um, <laughs> This is one of the main discussions that I'm always having with my colleague Davi Dovic and her uh, institution that I'm trying to entice um, all, like, all around my work, like my passion theme-wise is participatory governance and culture. And through researching participatory governance and culture, you're faced with this problem like, hey, what do we do? You know, like you're, you're bringing the people in to participate. Um, but in order for them to understand, you have to make compromises on the end of the artistic creation, then you are like creating this sort of double frustration on the side of creators or on the side of the those who are supposed to um, um, join the process. And the same goes for the decision making. Not everybody's equipped or has the capacity to make the decisions, not only to, everybody has the capacity maybe to make the decisions, but not everybody has the responsibility to persevere those decisions and to stand behind them. And to really like um, put that integrity behind the decisions that are made. But to um, um, answer your question in like, again, researching uh, culture, policy, society, and this and that, this artistic and inspirational edge was one of the main things that was always pushing these cultural policy discussions forward. So the artistic creation was putting culture policy um, into the line how to renew itself and how to reevaluate itself and how to rethink its position towards including more people into the process and preserving the integrity of artistic creation. And I must say that I haven't still found a good model or a good way uh, that would sort of um, provide an example of how to preserve artistic integrity in relation to the rising needs and rising pressures for participation in all the spheres, in a, in a sphere of co-creation, in a sphere of governance, in a sphere of height of um, increase in the cultural participation or in a sense of passive, passive participation. And I genuinely do not, um, how do I say, have a, a blatant answer to give to you, apart from that these discussions have to be more intensified with the sector of the creators, not only policies, but of the content 
the culture policy regulates. Jesus, I said so many things. Thank I don't you. Know if so I, I saw two hands up and third here. So please, we have just uh, five, six minutes for... Hi, I have uh, one comment and one question. I'm from Poland, and uh, this year we celebrate um, 30 years of democracy because uh, this happened 30 years ago. So let's say that we can talk about uh, cultural democracy that is 30 years old. So it's not so much old like in other countries uh, of the European Union. And we had a discussion uh, in June about it um, in Poland, and um, guess what was the conclusion uh, about the culture democracy in Poland in those 30 years? People complain, of course. We have plenty new buildings, we have new uh, great uh, institutions, but still it's not satisfying. So maybe to feel better, we should talk about culture, not culture democracy. This is the, the, the comment. Um, but question, Stephen and Anne. Anna, you use only once education in your presentation. Stephen, you didn't use this uh, concept, education and culture democracy. My question is why? Because I guess that it's also important, but not important in this global view. Why it's important, I think, I don't mean education at school and all our works that we are doing, but education that will help us to increase the people that will participate in culture and will understand what we mean and doing by culture uh, democracy. And I will give one example of politician, Donald Tusk. He is famous, I guess, for everybody here. And he is the European politician, Polish European politician, that started to talk about culture after 30 years. So he needed time to understand how important is culture for the policy in general. I always uh, mention education in relation to cultural policies, especially concerning the topic that you are all here for. I believe there's something inherently unfair in the audience development concept, the cultural participation concept, that is now increasingly becoming the affair of cultural policy. So you have this proportional situation that the pressure on cultural policy and cultural operators to provide education for the audiences, for co-producers, for participants, for whoever, is simultaneously happening with a decrease in artistic and cultural education, in education policies on European level. And I think that this is something, like as I said, inherently hypocritical and inherently unfair in this sort of situation. I mean, culture policy has enough on their or culture. Culture policy has enough burden on their own backs, you know, like to, to create social to cohesion, to create tolerance, to make a better society, to m create jobs, to uh, increase the GDP, uh, to, you know, like increase international cooperation. Now, the education hap is happening as well. So that's why education is my pet sort of mention. Um, in all my um, presentations, but also the awareness of the transversal and on the transfer of public policies is that it would be completely wrong to think that culture policy, culture democracy included, functions completely autonomously from other public policies. And this is what Stephen also mentioned in his um, presentation. When culture democracy was flourishing at the time, it was not only a matter of culture policy itself. It was a matter of social policy, of economic policy, of urban planning policy. Like when the culture centers were flourishing in the 60s and 70s, they were part of the urban plans, of the spatial planning, not only of the culture policy. So we do need also to like, um, talk about transversal policy action and seeking responsibility for culture affairs from the other sectors and from the other policies. The same way cultural policy is adjectival and being used for other policy ends rather than its own. Do you want to add? 
Go on. Not sure explain. I can follow that up. Um, so, I mean, uh, just a, an observation, I suppose, which is that, uh, I mean, uh, academics use this phrase all the time, the social stratification of cultural consumption. Um, should have it on a T-shirt or something. But um, I, what that it means is that the, there's great inequality in the consumption and production of culture. We all know this, or at least you should know it, and if you don't, go and find it out. But that inequality is equally reflected in education. Mm -hmm. You know, your access to music lessons, the, whether your school runs drama classes. You know, I'm a parent, I feel this firsthand. I mean, there's a huge amount of work done about inequality in the creative industries. You know, in the UK now, all of our actors are posh people who went to private school because that's the only way you can afford to have that career is if you come from an economic and social position that you can afford to earn no money whilst you become an actor. So I think, uh, I mean, the reason I don't mention education is because it's a whole other lecture, basically. Um, but I think the inequalities that we see in education are, uh, are mirrored in the inequalities we see in the cultural sector. And to go back to that, um, the use of the term intersectional, this is what I mean. It's like, if you don't have access as a child to music lessons because your school has no money, they can't afford to have a music teacher, and if they had a music teacher, they'd have no instruments anyway, and you're not getting that education within the school system, irrespective of the fact that your parents are working two jobs and don't have time to, you know, they can't do it themselves. All of these different structural issues, the economic and the social and the educational and the cultural, all conspire to deny you what might be considered your basic human rights of those forms of cultural participation. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately this becomes a much bigger, wider debate about how cultural policy needs to work with different uh, sections. I'm going to stop there and give a short answer. Thank you. Uh, so, time flies. So, unfortunately, I have to stop uh, the discussion because we are completely running out of the time. You are a fantastic audience. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your great intervention during this discussion. And special thanks again for Anna and Steven's intervention and also for their uh, very informative and dynamic answers and the comments to all your questions. So thank you all again. And now just a short announce, uh, all participants of the summer school and the open conference stay here, isn't it? Yeah, for another keynote. And the participants of the policy forum uh, can take a 15 minutes of a break and the gathering will be on the policy desk. And with my colleague, we are going uh, to our foyer to spend uh, hours together. So thank you one more uh, for your patience. Thank you.
Hi. Do you listen to me? Yeah. Okay, I know you heard the word break, and you were all really excited about it. Some of you thought, oh, this is for me, but it was not. It was only for the policy makers. <laughs> Our break will be just after listening to Wayne Modest. I'll introduce him briefly, uh, but I just wanted you to know that I met Wayne at a conference this year, and I immediately thought that we should have him in here in the most political day so far. The ones who are with us from Monday on know what I'm talking about. Today is kind of um, a very political day, which I find quite nice for discussion. And Wayne in that conference just made me feel uncomfortable, disquiet, but also showed me that as a professional and a cultural professional, I should embrace that discomfort and make it into action. And that's something I've been working on uh, from that day till today. So we're going to listen to him. And Wayne is the head of the Research Center of Material Culture. He is also a professor of material culture and critical heritage studies in the Free Universiteit Amsterdam. And he's coming today to talk about two buzzing words that we listen to so many times these days, which is inclusion and diversity, and just call it into discussion, just for us to think about, are we having a kind of a nostalgic uh, recollection of those words, or are we really meaning that these words, or using these words in the cultural field, mean that we have a major shift to make? So let's listen what he says. I'm going to use this one. Is that all right? Can you hear me? All right. Um, thanks for inviting me um, to speak. Um, and generally, when I'm nervous, I start walking around. So, so I'm going to do that today because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm going to be reading a little bit, but more in a kind of conversation with you all. Um, my title on being included um, comes from a scholar, um, a feminist thinker, um, Sarah Ahmed, um, and I've included the statement after that again and again and again. And I'd like to use it again and again and again and again because just to mark out the terrain of my discussion today, conversations over inclusivity and diversity are long conversations. We've been having them for so long now, I sometimes wonder if cultural institutions will ever change. Or are we just doing it because we like to talk those words? So that's basically my first challenge to you. What might it mean for cultural institutions to take those words seriously? And secondly, to mark out the specific terrain in which we operate now, where, and I hope I'm allowed to do this, I didn't consult first, but forgive me right after I say it, where activists in the Netherlands like all other parts of the world I know of right now who are invested in museums are saying, fuck diversity, decolonize. They are no longer interested in diversity as a practice because they feel that it has done nothing. So we're going to in, in, in engage in that kind of discussion um, today. And that's why I call it the per perpetual return. I'm going to read a little just because every time I give a lecture, people always come up to me and they say, wow, that was emotional. And my intention is not to use emotions. There is some theory behind it as well. So I'm going to read a little so that you know that I can be theoretical. And then I do the emotional labor so that you, you're all right with that. So one of the things that I want to start out to you are four quotes, just as a starting point for our thinking. What does it mean to be a public institution in the present? If we understand ourselves to occupy a particular moment in Europe today, a particular moment in Western Europe today, some would say, or in Europe more generally, a moment marked by Brexit, but marked by other anxieties about the failure of the multicultural polity, the failure of inclusion, integration, and a failure that many of us in our 
policy regimes, political regimes, project onto some other person, those people who are coming in to take over, those people who are perpetual migrants. They've been here since 19 whenever, but we still talk about them as migrants. What does it mean to be a public institution? What does publicness mean when we start thinking critically about them, those thems, as part of our public? And I want to make an even more uncomfortable statement marking a question that was asked earlier. What does it mean when every time we talk about the inclusion of others, a question that is asked is, and this is not a criticism of the question, but is an important question, does that compromise the quality or the integrity of the arts? What does it mean that when we include people, the idea is the quality is going to be less? Because you ask the question, did you invite them in because they are good, or did you invite them in just because they're a woman or a person of color? So my question then is, do we ask ourselves that question internally? Are we good enough inside for the work that we need to do? Because to ask the question outside is to presume that the person isn't good enough, and it presumes that we internally are stellar and excellent. <laughs> Might that not be so? Could be, eh? I want to trouble you with that. My second question is, and this comes directly from the mission of our museum, what does it mean to be a you and you and you here in the front, to be responsible, to feel a sense of responsibility for the world we share with others and the others we share the world with? I take that up in this moment of anxiety about climatic futures, and the world around us, but also coinciding two very big um, 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 anxiety that we have in Europe today. One is about the future of our environment, the future of our planet, and the second one is the future of our multicultural polity. Sorry to say this, Stephen, but Brexit marks out a very apocalyptic notion about multiculturalism. But we shouldn't blame Brexit, because in many of the places we inhabit in Europe today, we also think through that apocalypse. What does it mean to feel a responsibility for the world we share with others? My third question, and this is a struggle for me. Somebody said just now that the two presentations were um, sad, that was the word? Pessimistic. And to be honest with you, I, I am the, I, 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 I don't believe in this thing of optimism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not optimistic because as we look around what is happening today, especially me anyway, I can't say for you, I don't see much to be optimistic about. But I want to shift your register a little bit um, to something um, Terry Eagleton speaks about. Perhaps we should stop thinking in terms of the glass half full or the glass half empty, which is about optimism and pessimism, depending on the way you look at it. As I said in my last talk that I was here, no matter how I look at it, the glass is still half. It's just half. I want to sketch another kind of horizon. And the horizon that I want to suggest for you today is that I'm hopeful. Hope is a stubborn impatience with the present. Hope is activism for me. Activism that says that this is crap and we're not going to stay with it, we want something else. Hope is what people believe in when there's nothing to be optimistic about. This emerges from my other part of my work where I work on questions of slavery and notions of freedom. Because in a society, for example, and this is not to make it to point a finger, but in a society like the US that is marked by a narrative constitutionally of notions of freedom and equality, the enslaved, for the enslaved, 
there was no, no such notion. There was a foreclosure of that possibility because there was a foreclosure of the possibility of them being human. But the enslaved had hope because what they wanted to do with hope was to imagine the extension of the notion of freedom that would include more humans in it, which is themselves. So in a way, what they did was to reorganize the notion of freedom in itself, of justice. And I want to suggest that that is what women did when they fought for the right to vote. Because as men, you speak about yourself as the white men, but I will speak about myself as the short black man from wherever. As men, we also foreclose the possibility of their political rights. What does it mean, the right to a vote? So they too fought to open that possibility for what actually our understanding of human rights are. In that sense, they too were hopeful. I don't think of that as optimism. And my last point, and then I start reading a little, and then I go through some things. I struggle with the notion, no, let me give you this one. Rather than being pessimistic, I want to change your view by suggesting that we occupy the most hopeful moment in the world today. And I don't want to, it doesn't, that's not an attempt at exaggeration, but rather in the place where I work, I work in what is called a Folkokunda Museum, an ethnographic museum, and every day, everybody criticizes that as the most hopeless museum in the world. <laughs> that's where all of colonialism is put. It is the most colonial institution ever. I've been trying to push it away and say also that the opera is a little colonial and art institutions are a little colonial as well. But one of the things that I want us to hold on to here, and I know that many museums professionals who work in institutions, especially in parts of Europe where there are a lot of activists pushing against the museum, and it is one of the most uncomfortable feeling in the world. You know, you're going to an event and your stomach feel really tight because you don't know what you're going to do. And are, are they going to cuss you out on, on, on Facebook? That kind of what we call in the Netherlands cramp, that tight feeling in your stomach. Actually, my last point here, and then I'm going to sit down, is that rather than imagine that as a terrible thing, and activism as a bad thing that are, is taking us over and terribly t tearing apart our quality. Perhaps we should imagine it as a radical impatience with the present and a hope for a future moment when something anew can be created. I occupy that position every day to think that we are in a hopeful space because we are all part of their activism. So I'm going to read a little for you and then probably sing a little, I'm not so sure yet. <laughs> I do that when I'm nervous. And I want to start out, that was what I was going to do. I want to start out with the, the new um, ICOM definition. I don't want to put anybody on, 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 on at, to make you uncomfortable, but I really, really want to ask you who supported it and who didn't. I won't ask, it's all right, no, no, because some people might feel bad to say that they didn't. <laughs> no, no, it's all right. It's like, it's like going to people and ask them, Did you, are you pro or against Brexit? They don't want to tell you. <laughs> I don't want to do that. One of the difficulties with this definition for us though, when we looked at democratizing, inclusive, polyphonic, and the idea that we were going to be interested in questions of human dignity, social justice, and planetary well-being, is that I must say that when we as a museum saw this definition, we felt that it coincided with our mission. It felt that, oh, this was describing what we are interested in doing. This is not to suggest that the, as a, as a, as a definition, the, the questions about the definition, but I wonder whether or not the museum of the present 
is a museum where those words become very urgent. I wonder, even if they are not definitional, if they can define our practice. Um, amidst the anxious politics that animates discussions about the present and future of Europe, battles over inclusion, over questions of belonging and citizenship, over who is considered to be European, are also battles over what constitutes the notion of European heritage. Cultural studies theorist Stuart Hall brought this to our attention already in the mid-1990s when he asked in his Whose Heritage? Unsettling Heritage, Reimagining the Post-Nation, he asks, whose heritage is it for anyway? He continues to argue that, I quote, in Britain, in the, in the British case, the answer is clear. It is intended for those who belong, a society which is imagined as, in broad terms, culturally hege um, homogeneous and unified. Undoubtedly, similar claims could be made of other parts of um, um, Europe today, including the Netherlands, where I sit. Indeed, imagining uh, imaginations of European belonging as homogeneous, both co culturally and racially, have only intensified in recent years, manifesting in growing exclusionary political formations and characterized by increased forms of xenophobia and Islamophobic nationalism. Some scholars have called this the culturalization of citizenship. Others have insisted that we need to continue to address the raised nature of such exclusionary discourse. Those forms of imagining the nation presume that the multicultural project, that pluralizing polity we have come to know across Europe, North America, and other places across the world, which Hall identifies as having started for Europe in earnest in the aftermath of World War II, that multicultural project has failed. At least on this account, it is dead. In the nar this narrative, formerly colonized people and labor migrants now living in parts of Europe are, imagining, are imagined as a threat to European identity, to its culture, through its housing stock, through its welfare provisions. It is they according to this argument, that do not belong. They do not fit. Hall declares it is long past to radically question this foundational assumption. I, like many other scholars, included, I'm sure, here in this room, continue to question the proclaimed death of multiculturalism. Yet the death that I want to talk about today is possibly another death. Are we seeing the demise of inclusion and diversity as notions that we work with? Now, for me, and I was very pleased this morning with the discussion, because I'm going to be honest and say many museum studies discussions I find boring. I find them boring because they very often do not want to actually address the political domain of what is culture. So when I heard Stephen this morning and Anna speak, they were really getting at the nitty gritty at what does it mean to think class and class exclusion. I would suggest that popular music is another, we probably should put more, more money to popular music because more people participate in it than the opera. But that's another story altogether. Let's not talk about the opera again for the day, all right? <laughs> But I was interested in what does it mean to think, and it is the first conference that I've been to where the question of intersectionality has been raised. What does it mean to think the overlapping concerns for questions of class, gender, sexualities, and race within the language of inclusion that we use in our museum? What does it mean for us to always feel anxious when it comes to certain narratives around inclusion. How many of you in this audience will very easily, when somebody says, but, and I'm going to not name a particular group, when somebody says, we need to address the fact that certain ethnic, ethnic eth ethnicized or racialized groups do not come to our museums, how many of us get anxious? And the first thing that we say is, but it's not only about race. And then we name class, gender, sexuality, uh, um, age, 
And we continue to name a whole litany of things that we need to address without also understanding the overlap that these litanies mean. How many of us do that because we have an anxiety in our stomach, really cramp, to actually talk about the fact that racialized exclusion is happening in our institutions and we don't want to talk about the concept of race. In the Netherlands, I can tell you that is the case. Many people find racializing discourses so uncomfortable that they just can't deal with it as a conversation. Some people find class discussions uncomfortable, so they can't listen. So what does it mean to think diversity when we can't even name the modalities of exclusion that makes people, keeps people outside? This has been a struggle within political philosophy for a long time. I work with a particular scholar who I really love, um, Iris Marian Young. Some scholars don't like her work at all, or they like her work, but they criti criticize her. Because Iris Marian Young was interested in a, a conversation about structural exclusion. And what are the structures in your institution that causes some people to feel pushed back? So one thing, for example, we in our museum do, and then I go to conjuncture, is that in our museum we say, we're trying to think about what language we use even at the, the, the information Bali. I don't know, at the end of the day we have a, a, an announcement in our museum which says, ladies and gentlemen, the museum is now going to close. Please, punchy, punchy, punchy. And we do it in four languages. But what does it mean that somebody who is, imagines themselves as non-binary is not included in that ladies and gentlemen announcement. Should they stay in the museum? <laughs> is that what we're talking about? But also, another simple, simple thing. My kind of museum as well struggles with another kind of discourse and we just did a book on it called Words Matter. And in the Words Matter book, we went through and we chose 54 words that we would either never use again in the museum text or in our, how we address people. Those 54 words are very difficult, come most, mostly out of my kind of museum, so an ethnographic museum. And one of the things that we said is that language is abusive. Language can be abusive, but not only in the terms of visitors. So what is written on the text boards? Are the text boards written in such a way that people feel welcomed, aggressed, excluded? And I want to show you a little project we did recently, this one, called Decolonize the Museum. And what we did was that we, in, we, in, we invited a group of three young people to come into the museum, at the Tropa Museum, and look at every single aspect of the museum's um, publicness to try and understand how do people feel in relationship to some of our practices. When many people thought about decolonizing the museum, they thought that it was going to be a conversation only around um, race as a structure or questions of colonial afterlives. But for the team of decolonizing the museum, it was a more embedded structure. So one of the things, for example, which we had was that we did not have good facilities for the disabled. Actually, if you were a disabled person, one of the only ways to get upstairs was to go through a, um, um, the elevator for, um, for goods. So we have to pull you around to give you that. And one of the, one of the participants, she was, she was really upset. She said, what are you saying to that visitor? Your goods. <laughs> what are you saying to that visitor? So one of the things that Decolonize the Museum helped us to do was to try and think about the complex intermingling of an institution that says that it is public for a changing public, but that in our structures, in the intimacies of our structures, we were not doing public work at all. But it was not only that. I had an email recently from one of my colleagues to somebody outside 
inviting her to participate in a clunk board group, which is that a, a focus group that we were organizing. And the email itself was not intended as bad, but the email was so racialized and put the person in a box that the person said, you know, I can't do this. And funnily enough, somebody even asked me recently, they asked me to be an expert on an expertise panel. And they said to me, um, Wayne, I'd like you to be an expert on this expertise panel. And I said, yeah, I'm uncomfortable with this. And, and, and eventually, watch. <laughs> in the Netherlands, we have a little bit of a funny way of talking sometimes. She said, I asked her why. And she said, because you have a little color. <laughs> and I thought, that's the that kind of honesty. You know? it's a, that's the kind of honesty. But, but even... What, what was at stake in this discussion in Decolonize the Museum was my colleagues from outside asking, what are the microaggressions that operate internal to your organization that makes people from different, um, different plural backgrounds not feel at home in meetings as members of staff? when they go to the coffee machine, those kinds of things. How do you ensure that your meeting environment is somewhere that is safe and does not presume a normalization of one form of thinking? You understand what I'm saying? Tell me. If you don't, yeah? All right, good. It was within that frame that we started as a museum to think about how do we reorganize ourselves. And what, um, and I want to go back to um, this statement, which comes again from Stuart Hall, who I'm, I, I really love. And Stuart Hall has, how much time do I have left? Brilliant, brilliant. Stuart Hall speaks of a conjuncture a moment of danger or of opportunity that was something to intervene in, a configuration whose components were to be rearranged through practice. It was a call to action. And I want to ask you, what is the current conjuncture? Where are you from, if I may ask? Portugal. What is the current conjuncture in Portugal? What is happening here now as a political space to think about the location in which your museum operates. What are the questions that are being asked? In the Netherlands, it is a very, very difficult discussion about whether or not cultural institutions are just too white. It is about what do we do with the Black Pete figure, a, 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 a blackface figure that comes out every December and whether or not that is inclusive heritage. It is about whose heritage that is. Actually, the most recent discussion is one museum that decided that they were going to scrap the use of the word, the golden age. Because what the golden age does is that it hides the fact that within the golden age was a lot of slavery and colonization. That caused a lot of discomfort. Um, and I'm even ashamed to say it, but I'll say it anyway, where even our prime minister jumped into the discussion and said he was not in agreement with the discussion to scrap it. What we should do is to try and create a new golden age. Now, now I just want to leave that one there. <laughs> I must admit that as a citizen of the Netherlands, when he said that, I didn't feel loved. But just let's just, I just want to leave that there. But it is an asking of the question, what does it mean that museums are still trying to include us, include us, include us on their terms, rather than asking the question, what is the new terms that need to be re-inaugurated re so that our inclusion isn't about you? How might the, sorry Stephen, how might the opera look differently if the starting point isn't from 
its genealogy with that particular population that created it and still goes there. Classed, raced, what might it look like differently if it was reorganized outside of them as the starting point for thinking? I've always said many cities are created by men, designed. In my, how many places to, um, sorry, I'm going to be rude again, sorry. How many places are there for men to pee on the streets? No, what are called pissoirs, these little things. They're all over little city because men can't control themselves, of course, after the bar. <laughs> but it organizes itself in such a way that they, they can deal with their un, uncontrol. And then you go to a pub and you see four stalls for men to pee. And then you go to the, the ladies' bathroom, and what you see is that there are two stalls, and they have to join a line outside to get in. How do we reorganize the cultural institution that pushes against the normalization of one group? Because if we do not do that, that's not inclusion. What that is, it is... It's a, it's a form of what, what, what we would call in integration, assimilation, conversation. It's a form of assimilation. You need to come in and work in the way that I say you need to come in. And that's what happens when directors like me, you know, men directors start having jokes about how women do this and women do that, whatever. So my question to you today and to the, the challenge that I, I want to leave with you today on the one hand is because, you know, I don't want to generalize the conversation from the Netherlands to here. I, I, in my last lecture here, um, there was an article that came out in the paper, and I couldn't read it because it was in Portuguese. <laughs> and, and so I don't know what it said. Um, but one of the things that I don't want to do is to generalize the argument that the multicultural practices that exist in the Netherlands should be everywhere else. To be honest, one of the difficulties moving from London, where I worked in the Horniman Museum, to the Netherlands, where I worked in the Tropa Museum, is that when I moved from London, I could easily use the word community because it was tied to this thing called black, Asian, and minority ethnic. When I went to the Netherlands, I could never use the word community because nobody, the, the people got anxious of the splitting. And when I speak to my colleagues in France, there is also the notion that community is not a, a language that you can use. So my intention is not a generalization. My intention is to ask you, what is the conjuncture of this moment here, but also in England and in the places where you work, which means that the structure of the institutions in which we work marginalize some people and continue to marginalize them under the nomenclature of normality. And that normality is about, but they aren't experts as we are experts. Did they get their jobs only because they were of color or gender? But it normalizes it based on our ability, our ableness. And I will turn to my last thing. I have a part in my paper here which I speak about the genealogy of, um, of diversity talk in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, we started to do diversity and inclusion from 1980s. That was a part of the museum practice, tied with a government minister's principle, which wanted to ensure that immigrants were going to be included. We've been doing that forever. And I want to suggest that, and this was, came up in the, in the presentation before, because of the intersectional, not only of intersectional idea, identities or identification, but because of the intermingling structure of education, schools, institutions, government, and policymakers, what you find is that the radical change towards an inclusive program in museums have not happened. There aren't a lot of people being trained as anthropologists, for example, of diverse backgrounds who would work as, 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 as anthropologists in my museum. If I stick to anthropology as the only domain from which curatorial expertise can come, 
then my museums will never change. Why I said that I was going to sing to you is that when I was little, I wanted to be an opera singer. <laughs> and, and to be honest, that is true. It is true. Um, I, I had done a lot of singing. I had been on choirs and so. And um, when I moved to the Netherlands, I even found a voice tutor. I started doing museum studies, and then I decided, oh, I wanted to um, study something else. And then I decided, no, music is not going to be it because it, um, musicians are too poor. And if you want to be rich, you need to work in a, in a museum. <laughs> so look, look at me now, right? Look at me now. Um, but but now I, I hear Stephen say that somebody earns a million um, pounds, then I think I need to change jobs. But the question is, if we aren't going to address it as an integrated structure of critique of the very structures that ex exist to exclude, then I'm not so sure that I'm hopeful at all that things are going to change. So I want to close my, my thinking anyway with a few more discomfort, discomforting things. And then we can ask questions. If inclusive histories is the work of museums, the work, your work here, activists and academics from diverse stakeholder groups are tired of diversity. This is also the conjunction in which we are. This is captured when the slogan adopted a few years ago by some activists were, was fuck diversity, decolonize. Indeed, mounting critique from social movements such as Black Lives Matter, No, no Dakota pipe, Pipeline, Roads Must Fall, um, or in, in, the, in the Netherlands, the Museum of Color and the University of Color that are pushing for equitable and inclusive presents and futures to the most recent quarrel in Oxford about the ethics of diversity, the ethics of empire. Mark out this very special moment that we're in today. These calls challenge the very ways in which diversity seem to reinforce a particular position. It reinforces a particular group as being in charge. It reinforces a particular category or way of doing. One scholar, Vertovec, who is the coiner of the term superdiversity, he suggests that in itself, we should move away from the term itself as not being useful anymore, as hiding too much. And another scholar, Rinalda Walcott, has proposed the end of diversity, she calls it, for her, by the middle of the 1980s, at least in Canada, scholars and activists moved on from the language and rhetoric of diversity to a language that she in, thinks of as anti-racism. For her, there was an acknowledgement of a stalled non-performativity of diversity to produce any kind of justice. Is our inclusion policy about justice, about a just future? Or is it about the happy multiculturalism that we all inhabit, which is always talking about the good food we eat, the whatever, but not really thinking about how we change structures. So, so when we did the, um, the decolonizing museum event. Um, so they did a process, we changed it, and the <laughs> these, are our, these were the text boards that they produced. Now, any, any, who works in museum here? Everybody, yeah? yeah? No? One of the interesting about this is that if you work in a museum, this is already anxiety creating. <laughs> One of the things you learn in museums that the amount of text you put is about 72 words, at most 200 in a different place, and then whatever, whatever. And then they came with text for 500 words. And of course, everybody said, no, 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 that cannot, that cannot. But also, the text was quite feisty. 
the text basically said, as a museum, we've been racist for a while, and we continue racism. As a museum, the befeilichers, um, the front of house people, continue to practice exclusion based on, um, what you call it, um, profiling. And there was a moment in this project where we thought, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this, we can't do this, we can't put it up. And in the team, we were thinking, we've now given them carte blanche to do what they want, and we want to take that back. <laughs> <laughs> there was even a moment when they decide, as young people normally do, that they want to go and do this on Twitter. And we were thinking that it would have been a closed workshop where you know, we could talk together and learn. And so my marketing manager, and I, I'm talking about her out of turns here, she said, but shouldn't we also sit beside them and retweet, retweet to say the good things that we're doing as well? <laughs> <laughs> and we decided not to. And to be honest with you, I'm not so sure we're deserving of it. This made us go out into the papers as being a colonizing museum, a colonial museum. But it also meant and this is what I'm saying, that I'm not so sure we're deserving of it. It also meant that we could work on the next project with a group of activists who believe that we're committed through integrity to working with them in the future. That we really take seriously the work that we want to do and that we want to change. That we can deal with discomfort in a way. Because I can tell you, I said this the last time, two weeks before this event happened, I didn't sleep very much. I just had all sorts of um, pain in my stomach, stomach pain, whatever, because I was afraid, OK, I'm losing my job now. I'm losing my job. <laughs> but it reorganizes us. But it also does something. And this is where I'd like to, um, it meant that when we're curating an exhibition, we curate an exhibition with the same team of young people who read through, who come with us at the beginning to analyze the concept, who continue with us at the text writing to read the text, and who, at the end, and this is a terrible thing for any museum to do, because one of the things that we should know when we're working with activists, or many things, one, is that we should not farm out the, the emotional labor to them. We need to do our own work, because it is very emotional to do this kind of work. But what it meant, and what it continues to mean for me, is that I have a responsibility for the world that we share with them. But it also means that I make them, and this is a, I use this word negatively, it's not intended to be negative, I make them complicit in the creation of a narrative that they can also stand behind. And if both of us can stand behind that narrative together, then it means something about the shared futures that we want to create. How can we make ourselves so uncomfortable because our horizon is justice? And so I go back to this. Oh, this is my uncomfortable statement. Because to be honest with you, sometimes in the discussion around Brexit, around the immigrant problem or the refugee problem, one of the things I struggle with, and I really loved your, your image, Stephen, with the, 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 um, the white men list. And the reason for that is that I struggle with the idea that we have foreclosed the possibility of humanity for so many people. We, you, we describe them in such unhuman, inhuman ways. We actually create institutions where hu the human, the notion of the human, was defined by those white men in the past. And we continue to maintain that definition. And so I love this 1963 quote by James Baldwin, where what he asks us to do is to reimagine our conception of the human, of the public humanities institution, and stop making the human only one group of people who are going to include those others as we try to civilize them, very colonial construct, into liking the opera. Because at the end of the day, 
hip hop is as creative and as imaginative for other futures as other creative forms. And I want to stop, basically stop there. Are we in our institutions still thinking that us is normalizing and that them is incommensurable other and that they will only be included in the us when they look like me? I want to ask. Thank you. Oh. To close, <laughs> I no. No, I, I just one second. I want to do two quick things. And this is I always do it. Everyone is crying out for peace. Nobody is crying out for justice. That was Peter Tosh. He says, I don't want peace. I want equal rights and justice. And it's not that Peter Tosh wanted war, but what he wanted was the discomfort that helps us to sketch a horizon of justice. That's one thing. And the second thing that I want to say to you today, just because last week I gave a passionate lecture and the lady said to me, one of my colleagues who spoke with me, she said, you were so emotional. What I want to do, just because I'm, being, I'm useless now, right? I, and this is very useless. I was quoting just now Paul Gilroy, <laughs> Iris Marion Young, Anouk de Koning. So there is intellectual work behind it as well. <laughs> and the reason why I want to say this, a part of the act of exclusion in our own practice is to always think that the other, whether woman, racialized, gendered, is an emotional being. And we, man, white institution is rational. That's an enlightenment understanding that is quite strange. Even when the white man comes out with anger, you shouldn't do this. That's not anger, it's rational. <laughs> we have to reorganize our thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, I open for discussion now. We have more or less 10 minutes for that, so I think we can take three or four questions. Uh, who wants to make a question? Please just raise his or her hand. Alessandra here. There are other hands, so I can recognize them. Okay, another one here. So thank you very much, Wayne, for this presentation. This is precisely the conversation we needed to have, talking about the topics we are trying to tackle in these days. Um, I was wondering, what do you think about the Black Amsterdam project of the uh, Amsterdam Museum? Because I, uh, we met uh, in Mara Limon like a few months ago about that project, and uh, I was... Uh, well, we had a workshop also together, and I really enjoyed. And it was somehow tackling this idea of what is what should be a museum of a city like Amsterdam, and uh, and what's the process of actually uh, letting someone who's not like you get into the museum and taking the power to be the curator. So actually, uh, in a way, how this had to do with the colonial idea because being Italian, you know, in my country, we even don't know we have been an empire. Mm -hmm. So we don't think we, we had the colonies. We, it's, not, it's not part of our narrative. It mm -hmm. was that be belonged just to fascism and so it was, so no, no we are not, uh, it's not our problem. Mm -hmm. Well, when I see the uh, uncomfortable conversation, especially in the Netherlands and in the Nordics in general, so those countries that are used to consider themselves so democratic and so well. And so having this conversation about colonies was, can, could be such, so discomfortable. I really, it was kind of a surprise for me. So this is also our 
a European diversity thing. So, and so let's not talk about diversity anymore because diversity is from someone, but let's talk about variety maybe, which is more neutral because we are variated, you know? <laughs> we are variety. I don't know how to say it in English and mm -hmm. not to pronounce it. But that operation of the Black Amsterdam project that afterwards was somehow embedded or is striving to, um, to be embedded into the uh, museum because this was an exhibition, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea is how something coming from outside ha can have, let's say, in, can be in the position or the power to change the structure because all what we do, most of what we do is, some, is coming from outside. So how can this change actually happen? Because one more thing was that they did a caption project mm -hmm. on changing, reading the caption and changing them. So there was a painting of uh, um, slavery uh, plants, uh, and it was meant to be like this was the amazing blah blah blah, and it was just about describing terms of environment, and uh, of course they changed the uh, the captions mm -hmm. and uh, tried to describe it for what it was. But mm -hmm. I would have been more interested in having keeping the old versions mm -hmm. of those captions because. The principle was not just creating a new narrative, but also remembering that it's always about narratives. Mm -hmm. And these can be changed. Mm -hmm. So this was like, but how, that, how can that change can happen? Quick questions? Or just one? Just one. All right. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the thing is that um, I, I would not, one of the things that I think we should be um, cautious about is to, th and this is the, this is the tension in diversity conversation or, or structural inclusion or exclusion conversation. One of the push for the decolonization movement as well is to say that not because the person is of color, it means that the person is not of the mindset. So just including a person of color is not going to change the mindset, right? So one had, that's what, what they're trying to say, that at stake in the work, diversity or inclusion models have, cert, have many different levels. One. It is a question of representation. Who is in, who comprises the citizen and who is in your institution? Two, it is a, a conceptual argument that we need to think through, which is what does it mean that you want to shift the perspective of the language that you tell? I, I mean, there is, so, so the project that Imara and, and others are doing in Amsterdam are ex extremely necessary. To be honest with you, um, one of the things that I am fascinated by are the smaller archival institutions that are emerging, such as the Black Archives and other spaces like that that are pushing against big institutions to really change how they tell the story. And those two can be organic, can be tense, and that tension is important. But my, my sense would be, yes, I think it is brilliant what they're trying to do. My caution would be, let us not only think through, because one of the, the, the talents of the colonial project is also to reduce us to a certain kind of racializing logic which says that the black person is this and whatever, whatever. So we need to push against that as well. I welcome the work that they're doing in trying to think through what are the different narratives that are at stake in, 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 in the work that we do. Question? I, gu I guess we had another question over there. Right here. Hi, my name is Talila. Uh, you, pointed, you pointed out the importance of uh, changing the structure in the institution. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how the, uh, um, the audience experience has changed with the, in the exhibition of Decolonized, where you brought up uh, the young people for the... Um, mm -hmm. um, Two, two things. Actually, there were many people who were more worried that it was going to be um, a pushback, that people were going to be upset and, and that they were going to... Actually, it didn't happen. You know, there were many people who were just reading interestingly and saying, oh, oh. So, 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 so that happened. But much of the language change that we make in terms of shifting positionality, there are two sides to it. On the one hand, Many of the language changes that we do in terms of shifting positionality, audiences do not necessarily read it as being so radically otherwise. 
they actually come in to a museum to engage with texts that we write. So when we actually don't use the word Indian anymore, the audience actually doesn't see that as much as we think they do. It is us who see it and our anxiety. So people say to me, if you stop using the N-word, everything, we are rewriting history. No. Actually, we are more invested emotionally than them. But, but you ask a second question, which I think is, is, um, is, um, is important. And I think that is going to be one of the challenges of our future conversation around diversity. As our societies become even more polyvocal, poly, plural, one of the things that we are going to struggle with more and more, especially in this, and I'm sorry to use this word, it is from um, theory, um, or a set of theorists who think about it, but in the political domain, especially from the framework of what some people would call white victimage. So Donald Trump who says, but I'm a victim too. <laughs> One of the things that challenges a public institution is going to face in the future is how to create inclusive text that does not alienate a larger population that feels that the history of colonialism as celebration should be maintained. So there were many times in, and so don't think Italy is as bad as you think it is. The Netherlands, we also have our glory, colonial as glory. And there are many people who believe in that glory. So how do you not alienate them? One scholar, Catherine Lou, speaks about what she calls a certain kind of disalienation, which is not to make them feel uncomfortable, but rather to try and help us understand the complexities of the colonial. So that's one of the challenges we're going to face. How do you, so many people say a museum is not a place of truth, it is for multiple truths. I don't believe in that. There are multiple truths, no, that person was killed, colonialism did happen. It's not about multiple truths. The question is, what is our role in trying to combat the language that those people who came here should don't belong here. Go back to your country. No, there was a colonial project. The colonial project made this happen. You can't just say go back to you. What is the own country you're talking about? How do we participate in that kind of complexity without pointing fingers? One of the things we say is that our approach to the colonial is not about victimage and perpetrator. Our approach to the colonial is to understand, and I use this word incautiously, is to understand how we are, all of us, beneficiaries differently from it, but implicated differently by the colonial. So my implication is, and we don't know, I'm going to be very bad. When we say the British Museum says in its thing, I'm a museum of the people, for the people, and everybody should come. That's nice to say, but the visa regimes that exist in the afterlife of the colonial mean that the people from Jamaica who were colonized can't get into Britain for it to be of the people. So the question is, how do the structures of the colonial continue to implicate us differently and foreclose certain possibilities for some people while allowing others to live well? Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you all. We're going to have a coffee break. I would remind you that today we have an opening at the Modern Art uh, Collection building that is also about this. The Gubenki Museum has been having um, a programming throughout the year that is addressing the, co the, the colonization of the museums in different ways and has been selecting a lot of artists that deal with the issue in different ways also. Today we're going to have Irineo de Tuchel uh, with a special exhibition on subtitling and the power of giving meaning to things and you are all invited to go. It's at 6.30. And now, please enjoy your coffee. Just go uh, be back on the rooms. You have selected different things today, so remember this, the colored stickers. Uh, and just go to the rooms in half an hour, okay? <laughs>